So here I am in the stall in the bathroom in Glendive, Montana, and all of a sudden a guy next to me says, so uh, how you doing? I'm thinking, man, they are lonely here. <laughs> so I'm, I'm having this moment, and this, this guy all of a sudden says to me, so um, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm thinking, holy moly, some things are a little more obvious than others, I would imagine. And uh, I just said, well, probably pretty much what you're doing, but with a little less efficiency than I'm used to. A couple of seconds later, I hear him say, all right, well, I'm hanging up now because the guy in the next stall keeps answering all my questions. <laughs> Sometimes it's not about you. <laughs> but it's always about the customer. Often, speakers bring a one-size-fits-all approach to their presentations. By contrast, Dr. Joseph Michelli strives to create the ultimate speaking or consultation experience, providing everything from customizable pre-event audio emails, frequent pre-event planning meetings, and personalized post-event podcasts Dr. Michelli turns your event into a memorable, enduring, and playful experience. Are we going to seize the opportunities of change, particularly as we understand the consumer more, to create a more complete experience for them? Because the world has changed economically. If you look at the way we made money, we used to make it in the olden days just by taking things out of the earth, and then all of a sudden, we started to make things with the stuff we took out of the earth, and suddenly we were so busy making the things we took out of the earth, we didn't have time to do our own laundry or wash our own cars anymore. And so then we went to a service economy where people had to deliver those services, and now today we are talking about service not being enough. We're talking about having to stage that entire service in the context of an experience. Dr. Michelli sparks individuals and organizations to have greater impact with colleagues and customers. Borrowing from his unique access to great businesses, both large and small, Joseph delivers powerful and relevant information and stories. He expands on and punctuates ideas from his Wall Street Journal, Business Week magazine, and USA Today best-selling book, The Starbucks Experience, Five Principles for Turning Ordinary into Extraordinary. So Howard Schultz kind of got very fascinated by the quality focus of this company, but thought there could be more. He went to Europe experienced the European coffee house and said, what if I took Starbucks in Seattle with its high focus on quality and I merged it with the experience of the coffee house in Italy, which is more of a leisurely setting, and in France? What if I blended all that together and I put it into an experience at a Starbucks? Well, he tried that with the ownership at Starbucks, but they couldn't get that adding the experience would add value. So he left the company, opened up his own high-end coffee shops across town, and when Starbucks came available for sale, he and some other investors began the initial offer. Suffice it to say that his goal was to create such a customer experience that Starbucks could migrate itself from that single store at the Pike Place Market area to Portland, Oregon. Now, not only did they make it to Portland, Oregon, but they're right now opening six stores a day. Starbucks is opening a store every four hours somewhere on the planet. Well, let me tell you what I think the key ingredients of the customer experience were for Starbucks, and I think they extrapolate to all businesses. So I'll share them in a more generic, principle-based approach. But I think Howard Schultz's inspirational leadership was critical to this. He was able to see that they were not in the coffee business. They were in the people business serving coffee, not in the coffee business serving people. As soon as you take the premise that my real job is to make sure I serve those who want my product, I serve them, the product is, is irrelevant really at some level. The message is you have an opportunity to lift up the quality of life for people, to create businesses. As an award-winning radio talk show host and organizational consultant, Joseph understands and effectively communicates business principles that ignite personal and business growth. Joseph offers success strategies both in his presentations and book, When Fish Fly, Lessons for Creating a Vital and Energized Workplace, co-authored with the owner of the world-famous Pike Place Fish Market in Seattle, Washington. I do want to talk briefly about a little fish market in Seattle, Washington that I've consulted with because they created a customer experience that was so significant that they revolutionized 
their business model. I'm going to talk to you about the world famous Pike Place Fish Company, owned by Johnny Yokoyama. Bought the company in 1965. Johnny Yokoyama was excited, really didn't want to buy the business, he'd just been working there. All of a sudden, the <coughs> owner of the business decided he wanted to get rid of it because he wasn't doing as well with it as his dad had. He hated the business, so he wanted to get rid of it any way he could. So he said to Johnny, would you like to buy the business? Johnny, a new employee, said, sure, I'd love to buy the business. And the guy said, how about $10,000? Johnny said, I don't have $10,000. He goes, well, how much do you have? Johnny said, um, I have about $3,000. He said, sold. Johnny says, I really don't have $3,000. I was just trying to see what you're in for. <laughs> Turns out, Johnny was able to buy the business for significantly less than that on a month-to-month -month payment plan, to be exact. But he struggled with his business, like most small business owners do. He worked those 60, 70 hours a week. He pr produced a fine living for himself. He hired some people, kept them employed, and that was about the extent of the success of his business. Then, all of a sudden, he decided to expand his business. He was going to deliver a different product. He had no knowledge of the new product he was going to deliver. He was just going to try for something big. Instead of just selling fish at a tiny little fish stand above Elliott Bay in Seattle, Washington, Johnny Yokoyama decided he was going to go buy the fish from the fishing boats and distribute them, not only to his own stand, but to other fish stands throughout the, the region. Well, he didn't know anything about the wholesale side of the business, so within a month, he lost $50,000. He didn't have a relationship with the bank, so when he lost the $50,000, he had to be very creative about how he was going to solve this. And he did what every man loves to do when they have problems with finances. He went to his mother-in-law for a loan. <laughs> this breeds both inspiration and desperation. And Johnny Yokoyama had to figure out what to do after this failed business enterprise. He had a bad attitude and a bad haircut. And he had to figure out something to turn his business around. And Johnny's approach really became one of including more people in looking at options for creating the customer experience. And from the mouth of one of the burly fishmongers who said, let's be world famous, the team took off on a new idea. What if we staged a world famous experience here at this fish stand? What if we gave people the perception that when they came up here, they were world famous and they had stepped onto our theater that lifted and supported their world fame? What if we did that? Now, how weird is that? Well, the world famous Pike Place Fish Market in Seattle, Washington is where they throw fish. If you've ever been to Seattle, Washington, it is where you will see people throwing fish. There is now a best-selling video out in the world that, that has promoted the fish philosophy. There are books that support this. And now Johnny Yokoyama keynotes around the world for one hour at $50,000. The reality is you can turn businesses around and teach people for an incredible amount of money if you're willing to think about enhancing the experience. Joseph is a highly sought after guest columnist and television commentator for magazines such as Leadership Excellence and networks such as CNN. CNBC and MSNBC. He's got his own radio show on our affiliate KVOR in Colorado Springs. Uh, Joseph, is this a shocker? I mean, many of the things that I'm upset about today, thank goodness, my memory is declining because I can, <laughs> I can hide my own Easter eggs, you know? And I think... As an international consultant to government entities, professional practices, business to business providers, healthcare, and retail industries, Joseph offers practical ideas in the areas of change mastery, employee empowerment, and the creation of transformational experiences. Most importantly, Dr. Michelli leaves audiences laughing and learning. I'm thinking, man, UCLA must be the best school, and anybody who accepts me is going to be a real loser by comparison. So, what do you think I did in response to this terrible letter, feeling rejected in the hopes that I could feel something other than rejected and hopeless and helpless and despairing? What did I do as a setup? I wrote them a letter back. And this letter read, Dear Graduate School, please accept my letter of rejection of your letter of rejection. I look forward to attending on the first day of class. Please send information regarding books. Sincerely, Applicant Joseph Michelli. All right, I'm feeling loose and I'm feeling hopeful. Okay? <laughs> that was not an Elvis sighting right there, no. <laughs> Loose and hopeful, and you know what that means? I mean, that is what humor comes, it comes from the Latin word umor, U-M-O-R, which means to be fluid or flowing as in water. 
I was flowing. So what do you think they did? They wrote me a letter back. And this letter read, Dear Mr. Michelli, now we're getting somewhere. We are somewhat confused by your most recent correspondence. For the sake of clarification, underlined, there is no room for you in the incoming class, and you will not graduate. Sincerely, John Michaels, Dean of the Graduate School. So what do you think I did? Absolutely. And my letter read, Dear John. <laughs> Sir, it is you who is confused. For the sake of clarification, underlined, as it relates to the issue of class size, I don't take up a great deal of room. <laughs> Come graduation time, it's likely that someone will fail. I'll just fill in for them in line. <laughs> Love, Joe. <laughs> so what do you think they did? No, they didn't send me a letter back. That's too impersonal. John called me. And John says, we think you need a psych program. But it's not going to be here at the University of California, Los Angeles. Well, that was perfectly OK, because the day before, I'd been accepted across town at the University of Southern California, USC, the private school, not the public dump that can't make it to the Rose Bowl. <laughs> not that I harbor any hard feelings toward UCLA to this day. UCLA stands for you can't learn anything, OK? <laughs> And I stayed friends with John, believe it or not. I would slum out of my neighborhood at that private school, USC, University of Spoiled Children. I would leave my neighborhood, which was Watts, in order to go and hang out with him in Brentwood, Bel Air, and Beverly Hills. I was slumming in Brentwood with him a couple of years after I'd been accepted at USC, and we were having lunch in the terrace on Brentwood, al fresco. And as we were having lunch, John said to me, you remember when you applied here? I said, of course, you guys took such a personal interest in me. So let me tell you the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. We had a meeting, Joseph, between the psychology department and the Department of Security to discuss what would happen if you showed up on the first day of class. <laughs> Sometimes in life, you just can't take it lying down. You gotta play with your life. Let me give For you more, more than a speech, the Joseph Michelli experience awaits tax office official in Finland who died at his desk was not found by his colleagues for two days. <laughs> the man in his 60s died last Tuesday and while checking tax returns no one realized that he was dead until Thursday. <laughs> Procedures would have to be reviewed. I think in essence what they were looking for was you know, how it was that somebody could actually remain dead for an extra 24 hours in their cubicle without moving them out and getting a more productive person to actually generate something on behalf of the business.